Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Sparks and I'm the Associate Chair of Materials Science and Engineering at the University of Utah. I'm so excited to speak to you today. My talk is entitled, Accuracy, Uncertainty, and Inspectability, the Benefits of a Compositionally Restricted Attention-Based Network, which we call CrabNet, right? This work is from myself and my own group with uh, group members Stephen Kay or Kai Kaowei, uh, Ryan Murdoch, as well as a collaborator from TU Berlin, Anthony Wang. So before I get started, let me just recognize the people and work that made that possible. Um, obviously, my own research group at the University of Utah, these are the three principal authors on this work, but it included also contributions from a number of other great group members. And obviously, we're very happy to recognize funding from a, a career group grant through the NSF in the DMR SSMC program. So let's dive into it. Um, in the material science world, we have a data, well, you might be tempted to call it a problem, but it's also an opportunity. If you look at the number of publications as a function of year, you might have seen the graph some, something like this before, but on a log axis over here, we're seeing that this line looks linear, which means that it's actually exponential growth. The number of publications being published in the fields that you might be interested in is probably doing the same thing. The ones that I've listed here related to energy, you're looking at about 10,000 papers per year. So that's a mind boggling number of studies. So what are we doing with all of this data? Even the most you know up to date reading person is not gonna be reading 10,000 papers a year. So now we have to make choices about, are we just skipping papers and just reading from certain journals? Like this feels like a waste of energy and time going in to generate that data. Well, this is problematic for a lot of reasons. First off, materials discovery is really, really hard. This is not an easy problem. Uh, take a look at these images I've shown here. All of these images on this slide have something in common. What they have in common is that all these materials were discovered fortuitously, by chance. Serendipity, luck, whatever you want to call it. It wasn't rational design that said, oh, we're going to go out and discover Teflon today. They were looking to do something completely different, and it was sort of a happenstance discovery. And yet some of the coolest materials that we use were discovered this way. So this is a problem because going forward, we're going to need materials discovery to face all the challenges that we are up against, and yet we don't have a great tool. One approach would be to simply just hire more scientists, hire more PhDs, throw more money and resources at this. But it's a problem because materials discovery is extremely time and resource intensive. Just start with the lab, right? You have to get facilities and a physical lab space. So that's going to be money. You need to buy materials and that's going to be resources. Now let's think about actually synthesizing something. You have to make it. That takes time. It has a high chance of failure, which also means you're going to take more time. And you don't know the reasons why it failed, which means you're going to be troubleshooting. All this means it's just very time and resource intensive and we haven't even measured anything yet. When you start to measure and characterize your samples, this is time and money, right? It requires expensive equipment. It requires expertise. So you have to train people. You have to have people on the job for a while that know what they're doing. And then it just takes time. It's not super fast. So all these reasons are why it's going to be important to have a paradigm shift. And we can't just try and experimentally investigate everything because the design space that we're looking at is absolutely mind-bogglingly big. Uh, there have been estimates that the total inorganic compounds available to study is something like 10 to the 12th. Now, you could estimate this by looking that you've got four component systems, so it's a four choose 83 problem, but then that would just be stoichiometric one-to-one -one mixtures. When you now start to have taken the fact that they can be different amounts of the different elements present, let's say going down to 0 0.03, um, which admittedly, skips most dopants, right? Which are smaller than that. You're still at, you know, you're at this unfathomably large number of 10 to the 12th. To put it in scale, there's this cool website. You can go to htwins.net slash scale two, and it will show you basically the scale of different things. So this would be like going something on the scale of the size of the sun, right? And then going all the way down to something on the scale of the size of the ant. That would be the dopant level in the compositional space. So this is not like we're searching for a needle in a haystack. This is searching for an ant on the surface of the sun. I mean, it's just is totally impractical, right? We cannot do this with the old tools. We need new tools. Well, this leads to the idea of using machine learning and data science, right? You might've seen something that looks like this. You can start with machine learning. And since it's very fast, right? Lightning fast based on data trends, but it's not based on physics. This allows us to make predictions. These aren't as good as calculations and they're certainly not as good as measurements, right? So we call this lowest value, but also lowest cost but it can be done really fast. We can do billions of predictions very, very quickly. That allows us to then take the best predictions and now we can maybe do simulations on those, right? That's our medium value, medium cost simulations, which are based on physics. And then those ones, the ones that look good, we can move those up to actually making them. That's gonna be our highest value, but highest cost experimental validation. And what's terrific about this process is that even when you get something wrong, you don't get a great compound in the end, this iterative feedback loop where you can send back that simulation data or experimental data only makes your machine learning algorithm better and better as you provide more data to it. 
Okay. Uh, something that we can do with this is we can actually move away from local optimization of known materials. Uh, this is a bunch of plots for thermoelectrics. So you see that these sort of groups of materials shown here, these are clusters of known families of materials, right? And there's, you know, 10 or 11 families of materials that everyone sort of looks at. But what we would love to discover is not just some new zintel or some new scutterudite with average properties. We want to find some new chemistry, right? Far away in terms of compositional space, something that's unexpected. That's going to be where new scientific discovery comes from. But in order to do this, we first need to figure out how do you represent materials in some sort of plot like this? How are you going from chemical formula to a visualization where you're clustering things together? Well, to do that, there's a couple different ways to do it. One way is to rely on a composition-based feature vector, right? So you're going to represent a formula. And from that formula, you're now going to represent that in using its composition. You could also do structure. In this talk, we're specifically talking about composition. Because of those 10 to the 12th compounds out there, we don't know the structure ahead of time. But we could predict it based on its formula, right? So we're just sticking to formula right now in this talk. Um, so how do you do it? Well, you start out with all the different elements that are available. And you say, for each of these elements, you've got all this chemical knowledge. We as humans, as chemists and material scientists, we know these things about that. We know things like period. We know number of valence electrons. We know size. We have this information. So what we need to do is build a tool that takes uh, advantage of all this chemical knowledge, right? So there are ways to do this via unique uh, vector representations of a chemical formula. Let's take Al203. First thing we would do is I would normalize this to one atom. Instead of two aluminums and three oxygens for five atoms for formula, let's just normalize it to one. So it's AlO4 and oxygen O6, okay? Then what you would do is for every single column that you have representing chemical information, number of electrons, atomic size, all this jazz, you now multiply that column times the prevalence in the formula. So 8 times 0.6, 13 times 0.4, add that up, and now you've got an element inside your vector representation. So you do that for every single column, and now you have a vector representation of your materials, which is great, because now we can use that to start making predictions. How does it work? Well, let's first just consider pure elements, right? If you plot these based off of their uh, chemical information, they cluster together. Unsurprisingly, things like your noble glasses, uh, gases cluster together, um, and you've got transition metals grouping together. Now we can overlay on top of this different formulas, right? For salt, for Al203. Let's say that we know the value that we're trying to uh, predict for sodium chloride, but we don't know it for Al203. Something that we can do is take advantage of something called nearest neighbor interactions. Essentially, when you plot these in chemical space by looking at where they lie from their composition-based feature vector, some things that lie close to one another we can assume are going to act similar to one another. They're going to have similar properties, right? That's the nearest neighbor approach. And then you can take a little bit further. You can say, okay, based on how close it is versus how close it is to some other neighbor, you can actually treat this as a regression. So plotting it in a different way. Let's imagine each one of these points is a known value. You know the property. Maybe that's, you know, melting point or strength or whatever it may be. Um, if this data happens to fit a linear trend, then great. A linear model will do a great job of predicting some new compound. So let's say we have a new compound, Al203, and its composition-based feature vector x puts it right there on the line. Well, from that line, we can now predict a response, our y materials property, right? That's for a linear model. Obviously, you can do this for nonlinear models, right? We've actually done this for a long time. Chemists a long time ago recognized that, for example, boiling and melting point, they're not linear as a function of paraffin chain length, right? But you can still put a, put a good model to it. It's a power nonlinear model in this case. And in the last 20 years, we've gotten really good at building models that can predict really nonlinear, really complicated relationships. For example, take this one. Uh, let's say, how would, you, how would you normally predict that? Well, well, nowadays, we have algorithms like neural networks, support vector machines, random forests, which can learn these nonlinear behaviors really well, okay? Such that any point on this line, if you have a new material, we can get a pretty good prediction of what those properties are, okay? All right, so this has been done for quite a while. There's nothing radically new about this. We ourselves have done it. Here's an example that I like from our work. Um, the people that predict heat capacity as a function of temperature, it's tricky. Some of the best tools out there are known as cation anion contributions or the Neumann Cott method, which basically says you've got Al203, you take the anion, uh, alumina, you take the cation, AL, uh, uh, you take the anion, oxygen, and the cation, aluminum, and you just add those together. You do combinations of them, and it works okay. But we found that okay, if you just represent that compound in chemical space using a composition-based feature vector, you can actually do a pretty good job of training on that data and making predictions where it's outperforming some of the best-known previous methods. And there's been lots of studies in the same vein applied to lots of materials problems. If you're here in this conference watching this video, you're probably already involved in this. So. What is my talk today about? Well, 
our algorithms are good, but just like, uh, you know, Max Lord from Wonder Woman, they can be better, right? And we think they can be better. Just consider these three challenges that I'm going to focus on with uh, the algorithm we constructed today. First off, we don't, we're not that accurate. <laughs> There's a lot of things where we're actually falling pretty far short of it. For example, take this picture, right? You've got pure silicon and you've got doped silicon. If you ask many of the models that are available right now that are trained on a composition-based feature vector, you know, what's the difference between the, these two pictures? They're like, that's the same picture. It's all the time predicting things that should be insulators as conductors and vice versa because it's not capturing dopants because dopants are a rare event. They're really small in terms of their contribution to the formula, but they're big in their impact on a property. So those rare events are not being captured with the existing algorithms that rely on prevalence in the formula when making predictions. Basically, the vectors point at the same spot, so it's just giving them the same property, and that's not helpful. Another problem is that we don't do a great job of calculating uncertainty, right, of our models. So when you have to make a prediction, let's say you make a prediction of some strength for a steel, how confident are you in that prediction? Many of the models that we rely on don't have built-in uncertainty quantification. This is tricky because I'm going to go tell my grad student to make something. I don't want him to waste his time. I want him to know that it's going to work before I send it. So having confidence in your prediction. Then the last one is interpretability. Material science and engineering as a discipline is built on this concept of structure, property, processing relationships. And when you just use a black box that just tells you, you know, from income formula and outcomes a prediction without understanding the mechanistic insight, God, we've lost out as a field, haven't we? So we would love to figure out how to capture that by having interpretable machine learning. So what's our answer to this? Obviously, we think we have an answer, and it's with the compositionally restricted attention-based network, which we call CrabNet. Now, CrabNet, despite the artwork that my students made here for this one, they are actually transformers in disguise, right? Now, if you haven't heard of transformers, transformers are a big deal. Transformers about four or five years ago were invented uh, by Google. Um, they have done amazing things to absolutely revolutionize text translation, text generation, question and answering. They do some amazing things. Um, it's so much so that 2020 was called the year of the transformer. You see them doing amazing stuff like DeepMind's AlphaStar AI. We like this because we're dorks in my group and we love StarCraft. And for the first time, we saw a machine learning model beat humans, a task that reinforcement learning people never thought was going to happen, but it did it using a transformer. What's great about it, down here you can see like the raw observation. So the computer sees the units on the map, but then you can get these what are called attention maps where you can see where it's paying attention to. So when it beat the human, what was it paying attention to when it did whatever it did to beat the human? You can now see that. This is interpretability like we've never seen before, in addition to just a really good algorithm. But it also does great things like image completion. Here's one where you can see you start with half of an image and you allow it to complete the image. Like maybe this one that looks like it's wearing a kimono and looking at a menu maybe at a restaurant. Just some really cool stuff. One of my grad students who's a co-author on the uh, presentation I'm talking about today was just interviewed by Digital Trends because he created something called Big Sleep, which brings in Big Gan from Google, and clip from OpenAI, and it essentially lets you type in a text prompt, and then it creates an image that matches it. So they say here in the title that it's like uh, a Google image search, but for pictures that don't yet exist. Really, really powerful stuff in all sorts of fields, but no one's been doing it in material science, right? So we figured that attention is going to be a great thing to add to material science for a lot of reasons. First off, they're just really good. They are really well optimized for learning, so you get high accuracy. But even better, it gives you other things like per element representations. So all the different elements in your formula, you can get per element representations. That allows you to get element element interactions. So you know that if it's a certain type of bonding is important, we can capture those. We can actually map those onto what are called attention maps, which I'll show you in a moment, which allow us to visualize where the important factors are coming from. You also get element property contribution. So when you're predicting strength, what element is contributing mostly to that in your data set. And then best of all, you know, maybe not best of all, but really great is that these are permutation invariant. I like that because a chemical formula, we know that AL2O3 AL2 is the same as O3AL2, right? So it's a permutation. And this is permutation invariant, which is great. All right. So how does this actually look in the model? Well, you start out, you have to, we start with the elemental prevalence, but then we do this fractional encoding and we can either add domain knowledge via Matt Tvek embeddings or not. We can choose that. We end up with our element derived matrix. And upon that, we now apply the key component of any transformer, which is the query, the key, and the value calculation. Once we have that, we can do the soft max self attention to generate these attention maps. More on that in a moment. Um, what's great about this is we build four attention heads, which allows the, the algorithm to look at a problem from four different perspectives, right? 
and then we can visualize what is it looking at in those four perspectives. Otherwise, it's a generally straightforward neural network. We get the property prediction and the aleatoric uncertainty from this as well, okay? So let's take a look at how we do. We think that we've reached state of the art with this. When it comes to making a prediction of properties without knowing the structure just from the composition, we're doing as well as anybody out there and actually better. So let's do two comparisons. First, let's compare us CrabNet with Roost. Roost is another transformer approach. We basically came out with these at the same time. Um, they're different in their approach. One is graph based and one is not. Um, and yet you're seeing, you know, darker blue is better performance. So maybe we're doing a hair better. Realistically, if you include error bars, I think that we're neck and neck. Um, and then if you take these ones, which don't have domain information, that's hot crab, that's our model versus say something like LMNet, which also has no domain knowledge. Um, it's leaps and bounds better. So this is pretty exciting. We're achieving state of the art with that. Now let's look at some of the things it can do. First off, attention mapping. Attention mapping so great. This shows us what's being paid attention to. So let's look at different interactions. When you're predicting bulk modulus, you can say that the row for aluminum, it's paying attention mostly to oxygen. In three out of the four cases, it's really paying attention to the fact that, oh, I'm an aluminum in an oxygen system when it's making, it's updating its values for aluminum. Whereas oxygen's a little bit less so. It's only paying attention to the fact that aluminum's present in two of the four cases, and it's increasingly paying attention to itself. So what's great about these attention maps is it allows us to sort of construct narratives that might explain what's going on. It helps us build hypotheses. So I would hypothesize that oxygen pays attention to the fact that it's an oxide because oxides tend to have similar bulk modulus values. Whereas aluminum, when it's an oxide, it has one value and a very different one is when it's aluminum metal. So this allows us to uh, postulate new experiments to sort of test out these theories, which is something you just didn't have with other machine learning models. Um, here's another example. Let's take silicon. What is silicon paying attention to? Right, so all of these four plots represent what silicon is, silicon is looking at when it updates its values when you predict band gap. And it's really great. You see right away n-type dopants showing up. You see in a paying attention to transition metals. You see some of these plots where it's not entirely clear what the underlying physics might be. Is this just noise that we're seeing? Or is there a reason that it's paying attention to chromium, manganese, and iron, right, in this scenario? Um, this is pretty great because if you're trying to discover new physics, having something that tells you, hey, I'm paying attention to this, maybe you should design your next experiment around this observation is a pretty powerful tool. Um, and then being able to look at per element contributions to the prediction of a property is great. Here we are looking at per element contribution to the prediction of bulk modulus. So we know that stiff incompressible materials are going to be things like transition metal, borocarbides, and nitrides, which is exactly what the algorithm is paying attention to. When it's predicting high bulk modulus, these are the regions that are causing it to predict those. Again, not something that we could visualize before with other approaches. And then doing the same thing, but on a per element basis, you can look at, okay, oxygen, you know, the high compound, it's, it's contributing to those, but it does contribute a little bit to some lower bulk modulus ones. And then you can also look at a per element uncertainty contribution, which is another really interesting tool that we just didn't have before. So summarizing, uh, I hope that you'll be posting questions when you watch this in real time. I'll certainly be there trying to answer questions, but take a look at our paper, uh, look into this. We think that we've done something really great. Let me summarize some of our results. First off, we have shown for the first time the application of the transformer architecture to material science. Neck and neck with Roost, our friends at University of Cambridge and Alpha Lee's group, uh, two different approaches, but both using a transformer uh, foundation. We, in doing this, generated a very large and robust benchmarking data set, and we applied all the best deep learning methods to that, so it has a great uh, comparison stage built into it. We've been able to get improved prediction for the vast majority of materials properties that we looked at relative to the state of the art. We were now in, able to uh, capture um, property and uncertainty estimation, and we were able to get uh, element property contributions as well as element uncertainty estimations, and maybe best of all, the ability to create attention maps to see what is it paying attention to when it makes these predictions. Uh, we think that this new approach for visualization and for high performance predictions and uncertainty and interpretability is really going to be a boon to the growing field of materials informatics. So with that, I will end and I'm happy to take any questions. And if you uh, need access to the paper or anything, feel free to drop me a line. My email is sparks at eng.utah.edu. Bye.